The man had been seeing a young lady for some time. And though they had seen each other, the question of marriage had never come up. As a matter of fact, he didn't have a lot to say. He was sort of reserved, and she did most of the talking. Somebody said, I know how that is. <laughs> but then she had just kept talking about marriage and talking about marriage and painting a picture about how wonderful it would be if they got married. And finally he decided, if I can just get up the courage, I'm going to ask her. And so one night when she sort of caught a pause in what she was saying, he blurted out, Will you marry me? Well, she went ballistic, as most ladies would, and she just hugged him and rejoiced at the fact that finally he had gotten up the nerve to ask him, and, and then he just sat quiet and didn't say anything else. She said, I I'm just so excited. said, say something, say something. He said, I think I've said too much already. <laughs> Peter is a man much like you and me. He's a guy who has been in the valley, and he's a man who's been on the mountaintop. Peter is a man who knows what it is to walk close to the Lord, and yet he knows what it is to walk away from God. Peter knows what it is to say the right thing at just the right place when he was asked, whom do you say that I am, and his answer, of course, was, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. But he also knows how to say the wrong thing, to put his foot in his mouth, like many of us. Peter is a man who has suffered and who has rejoiced and been much in the same place as you and me. In the book of 1 Peter, in chapter 2 and verse 6, God gives us one of those brief biological and biographical statements about the Lord Jesus Christ that comes from the heart of Peter as he is reflecting on who Jesus is and what he means to him. And as we read it together, I trust that God will speak to your heart. And as I begin to try then and open up this passage, I hope that God will cause you to love Christ more than you've ever loved him before. Listen to what he says. Verse, uh, verse 6. Wherefore also it is contained in the Scripture. Now he's going to quote from the book of Isaiah here. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded or shall not be fooled or confused. Peter said, Jesus is precious to me. And I want to take that now and just ask, why would he say that, and why do I say that Jesus is precious to me? What does Jesus mean to you? If you were to ask the average person in this building today, what does Jesus mean to you, they would have various answers. If you ask them, what does your son mean, or your daughter mean to you, or your parents mean to you, and by the way, next Sunday, almost all of my family are going to be present, and I'm excited about that. They're coming from all points of the globe to be here. And I'm thrilled because there's no one that means more to me than my family. And you ought to feel the same way about your family. So uh, if you were to ask, what does your son mean to you? What does your family member mean to you? You would have a descriptive measure that you would tell us what they mean and why they mean that to you. If I were to ask some of you, what do your possessions mean to you? Some would give various descriptions. Some would say it's nothing, it's just a tool that, that God has blessed me with and trusted me with, and, and that's all it means. Others would talk with great endearment about how much their holdings in this world mean and how much their money means to them. Much like the fellow that I 
heard about who uh, was very wealthy and he was proud that he was wealthy and thought that he had done it all by himself and didn't need anybody else's help. Uh, as a result, uh, he's coming down to die and he knows that he's going to die and he says to his wife, now I want you to get all of my money and put it in a box and tie a ribbon around it and put it in the attic and when I leave, I'm going to get it and take it with me. And so dutifully, she did that. She uh, got all of his funds and put them in a box and tied them up and put them in the attic, and he died. A couple of weeks later, she was straightening up, cleaning up, and she needed to take some things into the attic, and as she did, she noticed the box still there, and she said, I knew I should have put it in the basement. <laughs> Where your treasure is, the Bible says, there will your heart be also. Why is Jesus precious? Why do I say he's precious to me? First of all, may I say, it's because he is the prophesied one. Did you note our scripture says, and it is said in the scriptures. In the book of Isaiah, in chapter uh, 28, you'll find the verse that Peter is quoting. When he comes down to verse 16 of that chapter, he describes how that God is going to lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. Now, he is the prophesied one. That's what I'm trying to tell you, that I thank God that Jesus is not just an accident or a blip on the screen in the course of time, but rather... He is one who has been prophesied from the beginning of time that God was going to send a son. In the book of Genesis, in chapter 2, you'll remember when Adam has sinned against God, God says that he is going to send a Messiah, one who is going to be a deliverer. He is going to crush the head of the tempter, even though the tempter is going to strike at his heel. But God is going to send his son, his Messiah. And so all through the Old Testament, you'll find those promises of God, those prophecies that God is going to send his son. As a matter of fact, if there's anything that has convinced me that this Bible is truly the divine and inerrant word of God, it's the fact that I have studied prophecy and there are so many prophecies both about Jesus and about places and times and people that uh, you cannot deny if you will just read it and it let it speak for what it is. There's no way in the world that men could have known these things, but God said that it was going to be. And when I hold this book and it says that God is going to lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, I rejoice and say, oh, praise God, that he saw the need of man and he told us that he's going to send one. And Peter says he is that one. But if you look at the chapter in Isaiah again, and back up one verse to verse 15, you'll find why God said he was going to send him. For man is going to be in such great need. Verse 15 of Isaiah 28 says, they made an agreement, if you will, between death and hell. They said, we're going to live for now. We're going to live for what we can get. We're going to live for this moment. We're going to live here, and it doesn't make any difference what the future holds. We're just going to live for now. And God says, because you have made a covenant with death and with hell, I'm going to lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. Jesus came so that he might be the, the basis for salvation, that he might be the basis for your deliverance. He came so that you might have life and not death. He came so that you can miss hell and gain heaven. That's God's word, and it's precious to us to know that God has sent his son to die in our stead. But not only is he the prophesied one, he is the sacrificial one. Again, if you'll look at our scripture, you'll note that he says that he's laying a chief cornerstone and he that believeth on him. Now, what is he referring to? He's referring to the fact that Jesus is the Christ. 
He is the one who came, born of a virgin, lived among men, but then went to the cross of Calvary and gave himself as a sacrifice for your sins and mine. This is played out beautifully for us in the book of Genesis when God says to Abraham, take your son, your only son Isaac, and bring him to the place where I will show you and there offer him as a sacrifice to me. And the Bible teaches us, and we would know from experience ourselves, how greatly Abraham loved his son. And now God has said, offer him up. And so in obedience to God, he gets his son, he takes some of his servants, and they prepare for his death. And so they come to the Mount Moriah. There they build an altar. There he ties his son Isaac. He lays down on that altar and Abraham lifts the knife as to plunge it into his son's body and give him as a sacrifice for God. But as his hand is about to descend, the strong arm of God stops him and he says, I see now that you love me and I have prepared a substitute, a ram caught in the thicket by its horns, offer him instead. And folks, I want you to know that you and I were under sentence of death. The devil had already lifted up his hand to strike at our heart and to take life from us. But God stepped in and said, I will give my son in your stead. When you see Christ on the cross, you need to understand that he's dying not because of some crime that he has done, but because of the sin that you and I have done. He's dying in my place. No wonder I want to cry out, Lord, I love you because you are willing to die so that I might live. A missionary was explaining this same message to a tribe in Africa. And as he came to the description of how they nailed Jesus to the tree for no sin at all, the chief of the tribe jumped to his feet and said, take him down, take him down. We would want to say the same. He doesn't deserve to die. But folks, heaven gave its grandest and most prized possession when, they, when the Father sent his Son into the world to die in your place. So he is the sacrificial one. I love him and I thank him and he is precious to me. Not only is he the sacrificial one, but he is the saving one. This salvation that he bought is for everyone. His salvation is for all time. Again, in the book of Isaiah, the Lord says, Look unto me, come unto me, all ye ends of the earth, and be ye saved, saith the Lord. Again, he says, Come ye, buy and drink, and buy without price, without money. Again, the Father says, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Seek the Lord while he may be found. And again, the Lord says with his arms extended, Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. And so the Lord extends the love of heaven, declares the love of the Father, and says to everyone who will, Hear my voice and respond. Come, believe, receive. You shall be born again. Have life forevermore. And then Peter says, in the book of Acts in chapter 4 and verse 12, neither is there any other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. You can't be saved by any other way. You may try to say, well, I'm just going to be good enough and God will accept me based on my works. Wrong. You'll miss God and you'll miss heaven if you're depending on trying to appease God with your works. If you try to come through religion, God's going to reject you any other way other than by way of the cross, and you'll miss the eternity that God has planned for you and me. I believe everybody ought to be saved. I really believe everybody wants to be saved. Years ago, I was pastoring in another city, and my phone rang, and a friend said, there's been a drowning down at Barry's Lake. Will you come and help us drag for the bodies? There had been uh, four folks in a little boat. They had gone out just having a good time that day. 
something happened, the boat capsized, and all four of them went down. Neither of them could swim. None of them had on life jackets. And so I and my friends and others began to ply the waters of that lake trying to find their bodies down beneath those murky and muddy waters. And by and by, one by one, all four of them were found and brought to the shore. Their family members grieving, screaming, crying because their loved ones had died. But the thing that impressed me more than anything else is I saw their bodies brought out onto the shore. All of them's hands were in this position. None were down by their side as though they had laid down to rest. None had put their hand up as though they were fearful of what was coming. They had their hands like this. And in their hands, all of them had their fists clenched. And in their hands, there was mud and grass that they'd clutched at on the bottom of the lake as if they were saying, I'm looking for something that can save me. And men who do not know Jesus are lost they are beneath the waters of sin and crying out, I need someone who can save me. And folks, I'm telling you today that the greatest need in the world is still that we can carry the message to every tribe, to every nation, and declare to every man and woman, boy and girl, there is a God who loves you and there is salvation in none other than in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And where Jesus comes... Jesus always saves those who call on his holy name. It may be that God brought you here today on this special day that you could just be reminded of God's grace, God's love, God's abiding mercies as he reaches out to you once again, calling you to repent and call on the name of Jesus. Not only is he the saving one and he's precious to me and I love him for that, but I love him because he, of what he has done for me. I'm telling you now that time will not allow me to describe what he has done for me. But one of the things that I want to note first of all is he made me conscious. He made me aware of my sin. Now you say, preacher, that's nothing at all. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Because in our day and age, more and more churches have adopted a methodology that says we don't want to make anybody feel uncomfortable. We want everybody to feel like they are comfortable. We don't want to talk about sin because uh, uh, that makes people uncomfortable. Who told you that you're supposed to be comfortable when you're in church? You're supposed to be, if you've got sin in your life, under conviction because of that sin. Because sin is an affront to God. Sin stands between you and God. Sin separates you from a holy father. Sin is a weight that is around your neck and dragging you down to hell. Sin is in your life and it's like a cancer eating the very soul out of you. Sin is that which is in your life that is destroying you. It's ugly, it's vile, it's a serpent that'll bite you, it'll destroy you. It'll take the very eternity of God away from you if you stay in your sin. And some of you are down under the waters already and yet God is crying out from above to reach up, reach up and be ye saved, all ye ends of the earth. That's a message direct from heaven to your heart. And I thank God for that day when he spoke to me. I've been trying to tell it for a long time. But I want you to know, folks, it's just as fresh today as it was that night when I bowed and called on the name of Jesus and he saved my soul. I wish I could tell you I'd never erred from the way. I wish I could tell you that I'd always walked in faith and faithfulness before him. I wish I could tell you that there was never a day when I ever uh, besmirched his name or denied him in any way whatsoever. 
but I'm just so glad that as a loving father, even when I stumbled along and made more mistakes than any man alive, I suppose, my father was there to say, son, just reach out your hand and I'll pick you up. Just call on me again. I'm still here and I'll have mercy and I will cleanse you. Aren't you glad that God is a God of grace and that he just reaches out to everybody, to everybody? Everyone, you're included in that. And by the power and mercy and grace of God, he has ordained that you'll be here today and that I can remind you of his love just to tell you that he is ready to do for you what he has done for me and all the thousands and millions of others who have called on him. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. There's room at the cross for you. He changed me when I called upon his name. He changed me when I got saved. By the way, if there's not been any change in your life, chances are you've never been saved. Can I get a witness to that? I want you to know, dear friend, that when God comes into a person's life, there's going to be some changes made. You'll quit your cussing, you'll quit your drinking, you'll quit your carousing, you'll quit all of those dishonest things that have been a part of your life, you'll quit, you'll start loving God, and you'll start loving one another, you'll be faithful to your wife, you'll be faithful to your husband, you'll be faithful to your children, you'll live in a way that others can see Jesus in you, and if you're not living that way today, hey, the altar is open. You need to come and say, Lord, I have failed in my plan of a storm-tossed life, but I'm putting my hand today in the nail-scarred hand. And the Lord will take you, and he'll bless you, and he'll put your sin as far as the east is from the west, and he'll cover you so that you might live and rejoice in Jesus Christ, your Savior and your Lord. Not only did he save me and change me, but my friends, he is my comforter. I bless the Lord that he comforts me. Now listen to me. Some of you who are young don't yet know some of the things that are coming, but I want you to know that life is full of pitfalls. Life is well full of all kinds of traps, and Satan is setting them for you. And there's a lot of heartache in this world. But you need to understand that as you go through life and your heart breaks at the point that you feel like that you can't live. As a matter of fact, some of you don't even want to face another day. And maybe you've come that way, this way today and you're just at that place that you feel like that you don't even want to go on. You're in a prime place for Jesus to find you because he is your comforter. He'll come and he'll put his arms around you and he'll lift you up. I wish I could tell you the numbers of people through the years who have said to me as I've come to them in the name of Jesus to give them a cup of cold water to minister grace to them that they have said to me, oh preacher, I thank God without him I couldn't face this situation. They've said that at the graveside. They've said that to me in the hospital's hallways and in the rooms where I visited. They've said to me this to me in the homes where I've gone, where grief has come in. But yet Jesus was there, and the comfort that he gives is beyond human understanding. I thank God there's not a day that I live he's not with me. I thank God that there's not an experience that he hadn't gone before me to prepare the way. I bless my Father that Jesus loves me, and he's there when I don't have anybody else that'll care. And folks, I want you to know that when you don't have a friend, he'll still be your friend. And when there's no one to lean on, he'll let you lean on him, for he is the comforter that we need in our world. He is precious to me. I have a friend who wrote these words, and it says it better than I can. When in the lowest valley, I have always found him there. Let me say that again. When in the lowest valley, think of your lowest point, where you've been in your life. Was it when your heart broke because people disappointed you? Was it at that time when you lost your, your loved one and maybe it was your dad or your mother or your son or your daughter or maybe it was someone so close to you that, that they just were almost a part of you? And in that time of loneliness and grief and despair, you found him right there by your side. When in the lowest valley, I have always found him there. 
He cheers me with his presence and sustains me with his power. He knows when I am weakest and he knows that he is strong. When I let him go before me, he never leads me wrong. In the valley, he's the lily. In the desert, he's the rock. He's the cloud that shines the brightest on the highest mountain top. In the garden of Gethsemane, the rose of Sharon blooms. In the darkest night, the morning star shines away my gloom. He is precious to me because he comforts me in my time of need. But then he's precious to me for he keeps me in the time of temptation. Now, I don't need to ask for a show of hands to see if you've ever been tempted or not. As a matter of fact, you've been, you're tempted every day, aren't you? I, your temptation may be different than mine, but uh, their temptation is common to all of us. And we need to understand that we need the tempter. The Lord taught us, lead us not into temptation. Don't let the devil get the upper hand over us, Lord. Keep us lest we would fall. I was walking... Well, as a matter of fact, I'd been in a restaurant downtown and uh, I just walked out on the street. I was, I don't know, it must have been a, a special day. I remember I was dressed up, maybe something like I am now. But I just walked out of the restaurant and turned to go to my car and I noticed as I came out, three beautiful young ladies, much, much younger than I am. When you're as old as I am, anybody who is under uh, 50 is young. But anyhow there were uh, three beautiful ladies walking up toward me and I just noticed who they were and they were nice looking and I turned and started to my car when I heard them. One was talking to the other two and she said, boy, the devil does that to me all the time. I was waiting to hear what was coming next. She said, just when I think I'm going to do good, the devil will put a good looking man in front of me. Now, there may have been somebody on the other side of the street. I don't know. But I wanted to think she was talking about me. I straightened up a little bit straighter, and uh, I wanted to stop. Let her catch up with me. But I did not. I went on. I came home. I told my wife. Do you tell your wife everything, preacher? Yeah, yeah. Because my friend, if God don't keep me straight, I promise you Miss Juanita will. I, I, you, you need to be understand. <laughs> when I fell in love with her those long years ago, I fell in love with her for life. And I've committed myself to her. And though the devil may put temptation before me just like he does you, I want you to know that my love for my Lord and my love for my wife and family keeps me from that temptation. And he keeps me. You see, the devil has set a trap for you. He'll do anything he can to cause you to lose your testimony and to lose your joy. And those are things that are so precious you can't afford to lose either one of those. And the only way you can keep them is that you walk in faith with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sure Peter must have been thinking about when he denied the Lord and how he cursed out there in the hall or in the garden area of Pilate's Hall. I'm sure he must have been thinking about the, the personal uh, attitudes that he had that were wrong when he says, even just I am just like those people who made a covenant with hell and death. I have messed up, but God laid a cornerstone who is precious to me. I bless him. Jesus means more to me than life itself, and I can't tell you enough about how much he means to me. But I'm afraid too many are like the young boy. It was springtime, and the waters were getting warm, and and the mother had said to her son, now don't you go down to that creek, don't you be at that swimming hole. You go straight to school and you come back home. Yes, mama. He's about to leave when she sees him. She says, what is that you've got on under your pants? 
And he stopped and sheepishly said, it's my bathing suit. She said, I told you that you weren't to go down to that creek and that you weren't to be in that swimming hole. He said, but mama, I'm just wearing them in case I fall in. <laughs> Some of us make so much allowance for we fall in rather than shying away from and being aware of what the tempter does. Jesus keeps me. And if you don't pray it now, you ought to pray. May I just share with you, I have a prayer that I've been praying for at least 43 years. I pray it every day. God, keep me. God, keep me, lest I fall into sin. For I don't want to do anything that would bring the name of my Savior down low. You see, I have too many people who count on me to allow anything to come into my life that would cause me to make anyone stumble or think less of the Lord than they should. He is precious to me. And then he is precious because of what he will do for me. You see, God blesses me with friends and family. I've got more friends I suppose it seems to me anyhow than anybody in the world. And I mean that. I just love people and, and God has been good and given me such great numbers of, of friends from all over, all over the country, around the world. Not only that, God has given me a great family and I thank God for my family. But they're a gift from God and I realize that. And whatever God has given, we have to hold it precious in our hands. But God answers my prayers. And folks, I want you to know of all of the things that God does for me, the one thing that I am so very much aware of is that God answers my prayers. I thank God that when I talk to him, he hears, he answers. And I pray that you will come to that point where every day will be so filled with communion with the Father that every day will have meaning because you're looking for his hand the way he has moved to answer your prayers. Not only does he bless me with friends and family and he answers every prayer, but my friend, he gives me hope in every situation. Now, there are some things that we're called on to face that it looks like it's hopeless. But I want you to understand, as long as I'm alive and God's alive, it's not without hope. And God comes through, and God comes through in miracle fashion. And there are times when, folks, you need a miracle. And God will give you a miracle just to show you that he's still able to do all things. And he'll do that in order to encourage you to build your faith and to prepare you for something better that's coming down the road. And when you can walk with him that way and know how precious he is. Have you ever been, been praying when it just seemed like God walked up and knelt down beside you. Well, I wasn't even kneeling that particular day. I was trout fishing. Now, there was a time, it had been a, it's been a long time. I'm going to try to recover it. Uh, but I used to, every Tuesday morning at 8 o'clock, I was standing in the river in the upstate South Carolina. I knew where every trout was. I knew their hiding places, and I knew how to lure them out and how to get them. And, uh, and so I was in the river. But I found out that in the river, the only thing you can basically hear is the sound of the water and the sound of the birds. And so I found that's a good place to pray, even while you're extending that line down, running that bait down in front of Mr. Trout that you wanted to catch. And I found that I could pray there. And I have seen the time when the, I'd be praying and God would be surreal. I felt like he'd walked up behind me and I'd turn around to see who was standing there. There was no one there in person, but I want you to know God was there in that place with me. Is Jesus that real to you? He is that to me. And it's wonderful when he comes and he meets with me in the prayer room. God answers my prayers. But then he assures me of help in the time of struggle and at the river of death. Now you see, I'm aware. I'm not, listen, I'm not planning to leave. I'm going to live a long time yet. My wife says I'm going to live to be 100. I hope she's right and I hope that uh, 
Uh, I'm going to live beyond that. But I'm ready to leave today if he's ready for me to leave today. And that's the way we ought to live. We ought to live like he's coming today or if he comes through the doors of death, we'll be ready when he calls. But I'm not, af I'm not afraid of death because I know he has conquered my enemy of death. I want to live so I can be like Dr. R.G. Lee, one of my heroes in the faith. Dr. R.G. Lee was on his deathbed, and he was such a man of stature that some of the greatest names in the Christian world had come to visit by his bedside. Billy Graham was one of those who was standing there. He had been in a coma now for some time, hadn't spoken, hadn't moved. And as they're standing by his bed and these great men of God are praying, suddenly they said that Dr. Lee's eyes flashed open and he sat sort of up in bed and pointed somewhere above the door and he said, there's Mama, there's Daddy, there's Lena, and there's Jesus and just laid down and went to be with the Lord. I want to be ready to leave just that way to know that he has walked with me in every moment of my life and he's going to greet me and bear me safely across to heaven. He has made me a home there. I know he has. Matter of fact, I know where it is. Not just in heaven. It's on Hallelujah Boulevard. Now, folks, I want you to know when you get to heaven, if you'll go down Straight Street and turn to the right, on Hallelujah Boulevard, my home will be down just near the throne of God. And you see, down here, I have to be reserved. I, I, can't, I can't show out like some of you can. I can't have Baptist fits and run the aisle and, and jump pews and all of that. I have to be more reserved to keep everything sort of in line. But I want you to know that when I get to heaven, I'm going to kick out the traces, and I'm going to shout and praise God for eternity. As a matter of fact, I don't know why we ought to wait till then. We ought to just have a spell down here, right? We ought to just praise God now. Start practicing for what there is on the other side. Glory to his name. Matter of fact, there's a song stirring in my soul. Sing it with me. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see When I look upon his face The one who saved me by his grace When he takes me by the hand And leads me through the promised land What a day glorious day that will be. One of my best friends in life's name was Bill. Bill was an executive with Southern Bell. Before Bill got saved, he was just a good old guy. He hung out with the boys. He enjoyed drinking and playing poker wasn't a bad man. He just had a good time. He and his wife with their friends. As a matter of fact, on that particular Saturday night, another couple had visited their home and they had spent the evening not hurting anybody, just drinking and playing cards. And their little daughter, who was nearly four years of age, just playing around in the room where they were, and where they'd left their glasses sitting on the table, she got that and drunk what they'd been drinking. And they didn't notice it until they noticed her beginning to stumble and fall. She couldn't stand up. She was drunk. And they just laughed at that little four-year-old girl who was staggering drunk. Somewhere toward morning, he began to think about what he was doing to his family. And he remembered from his childhood a plea 
that he'd give his heart to Christ. So the next morning, he told his wife, get up, we're going to get ready, and we're going to church. And to church they went. He said, I don't remember a thing that the preacher said, but I just remember that he was talking straight to me. And he said, when the invitation was given, I made my way to the front. And he said, in that church, nobody prayed with me, nobody talked with me and counseled me. They just handed me a card and said, fill it out. And then the pastor said, Bill has come today, and he's confessing Jesus Christ. Well, everybody was happy, and friends came and, and embraced him. And he said, before I got to my car, the devil said, you didn't get saved. Why, you're just as lost as you were before. And those people don't love you. If they did, they wouldn't have let you come and not be counseled and prayed with. And he said, I drove home and I fought that mental battle over again. You didn't get saved. And he said, I went into the house and went to the bathroom. And he said, I got down and leaned my head over my bathtub and cried out, God, if I didn't get saved a while ago, here I come again. And he said it was there that I settled it with God. He became one of the finest men I've ever known, one of the greatest personal soul winners I've ever known because he had made it right with Jesus. And everybody who walks with the Lord will say, he's precious to me. God has laid in Zion a chief cornerstone, but my life is built on that cornerstone, and he is precious to me. Now, if you've come today, and you can't say that with authority, when I give an invitation in just a few moments, I'm going to ask you to leave your place and come down here to the altar. There'll be some men here that'll help you. There'll be some ladies that'll be here to assist you, ladies. And they'll pray with you, and you can find him who will set you free, who will give you reason to live, and then who will point you in the right direction of life. If you're here and you've lost the joy or you've strayed away from God, when we give the invitation, I'm going to ask you to leave your place and come from all about the building, and you're going to respond. And as you come, you'll speak to one of our staff men or you'll just get on the altar and say God I want to come I believe that you have saved me but today like Peter I've stuck my foot in my mouth I've made my mistakes but I want to stand or bow and renew my vows to you and leave here today singing you're so precious to me if you're here and you're not a member of this church and, and you want to invest your life in the work of God through Langston when we sing, I'm going to ask you to come and just say to one of our men, I want to put my membership in this church. And a loving family will receive you, and you can be a part of the greatest church in the world. And I encourage you that you'll obey. Has God spoken to you? Has he called you? Is he yet speaking to your heart? In a moment when we sing, you'll come. Let's pray.